My father, whose name was Tony, his given name was Luke, but everybody called him Tony, was not very patient, especially around Christmas time. Now, if you have to understand the tradition in French Canada when it comes to Christmas, the tradition in French Canada where I grew up was that the children would go to bed and then at the stroke of midnight, <clears throat> the parents would wake them up and they would come to see what Santa had left under the tree. I notice here the trees, you know, all the gifts are under the trees sometimes for days ahead of time, but when I was a kid there was nothing under the tree. You, you only got to see it at the stroke of midnight, Christmas Eve. So you'd go to sleep, just barely, and then you'd be awakened to the excitement of the lit tree and the gifts under it, just waiting to be unwrapped. And there was great anticipation because unlike today, the presents, as I mentioned, were placed under the tree only after the kids were asleep on Christmas Eve. And that was done to provide maximum impact when everyone came running into the living room at 12 a.m. to the glorious view of the gifts and the stockings and the goodies to eat on the table. We would open our gifts and we would also receive visitors at that late hour, believe it or not. My aunts and uncles lived close by. My mother came from a family of 11. And they were eight sisters and three brothers and they all lived within a mile of each other, you know, most of them, and so one, one o'clock in the morning, 1.15, the doorbell would ring and my aunt would come up with her kids and, the, and there would be people in the house and we would open our gifts and we'd be running around and uh, we would be sharing Christmas fun late into the next day. As a matter of fact, a large meal was served at the time. Imagine, 2 a.m., you're having a big old meal, eating, now I said at the beginning that my father was impatient. Every Christmas Eve, I, I remember this like it was yesterday, every Christmas Eve as I, and I, I was an only child, so you know, this was the only story going on in the house, all right? Every Christmas Eve as I lay in my bed pretending to sleep, I could hear him trying to talk my mother into waking me up early so they could open the presents. It wasn't about him wanting to go to bed, it was about he just couldn't wait to open the presents. She'd say, Tony, it's only 9.30, you know, let's wait until the guests arrive to start the party and wake Michael up for his presents. And my dad would give her all kinds of reasons to abort her timetable and tradition, and I'd be in bed saying, go dad, go. <laughs> and then somewhere around 11.30, mom would relent, She'd had all the food up on the table finally and all the gifts under the tree. And, well, all right, you know, what, the kid can't tell time anyways. You know, what does he know? And then when he'd come running into the room to get me out of bed, we'd dash off to the tree, me ahead of him because he wanted so badly for me to see my gifts. And of course, he'd help me unwrap them. Do you have one of those in your family? <laughs> he'd help me unwrap. I'd be unwrapping. Okay, that's a good one. Oh, but this one's even better. Look over here. You know, and he'd be, I'd be handling and examining one toy and he'd be grabbing the next box to help me see what was inside. Like I said, he was an impatient kind of guy, especially at Christmas. I guess Christmas has always been about patience. I don't mean the holiday of Christmas, but the reason for it in the birth of Jesus. <clears throat> After all, the Jews had been waiting patiently <clears throat> for the coming of their Messiah for many centuries by the time the Christ actually came. Their waiting was not measured in days or months or even years. It was measured in centuries. And when He was born, Luke tells us an interesting story of a man who had learned how to wait patiently for something that took a long time to arrive. And so in this evening's lesson, I, I want to talk about Jesus' birth and how it was a particular reward for one man 
who had learned to wait patiently for it. Unfortunately, my dad passed away long ago, but for those of us here, perhaps the story of Simeon can teach us some valuable lessons about waiting patiently. Not just waiting patiently for Christmas, or waiting patiently to unwrap our gifts, but maybe waiting patiently for other important things and events in our lives. So let's go to Luke chapter two, shall we? And let's go down to verse um, 25, where Luke tells us the story of Simeon. Luke chapter two, verse 25. He says, and there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So in this passage, Luke is describing an episode in the very early life of Jesus when, as a baby, he was brought to the temple in Jerusalem. The occasion was during the purification rites necessary for women to perform who had recently given birth. According to Jewish law recorded in Leviticus chapter 12 beginning in verse 1 and following, a woman who had given birth to a son was ceremoniously unclean. This meant she was unable to enter the temple for worship for seven days or until the circumcision of the child. Then for 33 more days, she was not allowed to come into the sanctuary. And then after 40 days, she needed to come to the temple and be purified by offerings prescribed by Jewish law. And all of this had to do with blood and issues of blood and so on and so forth. And so according to these commands, Mary and Joseph were in Jerusalem in connection with these purification rites and they had brought their baby Jesus with them. Now aside from these rites, there was another religious duty necessary and that was to present the firstborn to the Lord. And you know, we kind of do that here, do we? In a way, in the spirit of that, you know, when we have new uh, babies, uh, some of our sisters have uh, new babies, they kind of bring them forward and one of the elders or Marty or someone, recently even myself, you know, we, you know, mom's holding the baby and the, one, the elder or the preacher offers a prayer of blessing on that baby and on that family to help them raise that child up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And that's kind of in the spirit of what this, was what this was here in the first century. It was prescribed by the law. Every firstborn son had to be presented to the Lord. Because in Israel, every firstborn son had to be presented to Jehovah as belonging to Him in a special sense. Parents would then buy back or they would redeem the child with a sacrifice and an offering at the temple. It was a way of saying, you know, the first fruit of our marriage, this first son, belongs to you, Lord. And they would you know, offer it in this way, and then with the offering that they made, would buy back, if you wish, the child. So Luke, what he does in his narrative here, he compacts all these various rituals into one scene. As Mary is at the temple with Joseph, seeing to her purification rites, and the presentation of their firstborn to the Lord. And so it's during this time that they are met by a devout Jew named Simeon. Now in the passage that we read, Luke describes Simeon as being, first of all, righteous, meaning he was good and he was, he was right with God. He says that he was devout. In other words, he was totally devoted to God and the things of God. And he was looking for the consolation of Israel. In other words, he was consciously I mean, all the Jews were waiting, but he, in particular, he was waiting consciously for the arrival of the Messiah. As I said, everyone who read the law and the prophets at that time 
they knew that God had promised the Redeemer, a Savior to the Jews. And they were, in a sense, waiting for Him. Yeah, sure, one day the Messiah is going to come. You know. It's like us. You know, one day the Lord will return. You know, one day we'll be with the Lord in heaven. We know it's going to come. It's been promised. You know, one day. But Simeon was special because God had revealed to him somehow, perhaps in a dream or a vision, through the Holy Spirit, that he would not die before seeing with his own eyes the Christ that was promised by God. Just like if, if God made that specific promise to you that you would not die before, you, know, you would be part of that generation that would be still alive when Jesus returned. Well, that was the promise made to Simeon. He would not die until he actually saw with his own eyes the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. Now, we don't know how long ago this promise was made to him. All we know is that Simeon had waited patiently for that promise to be fulfilled. And at last, it was fulfilled as he was directed towards the baby Jesus. Luke quotes his prophecy concerning the child, one that later we know was fulfilled as the gospel of Jesus was eventually preached and received by the Gentiles through Paul the Apostle. We also learn from Simeon some valuable lessons about waiting patiently on God's promises. Lessons that can quite easily be applied to our very different lives today. And that's the bulk of what I want to share with you. Lessons on waiting patiently. Lesson number one. Lesson number one is this. God's promises are not always fulfilled in ways that you would expect. God's promises are not always fulfilled in ways that you would expect. As a Jew living in those times, the last person that Simeon expected as the fulfillment of God's promise was this little baby, the first son of this poor couple from Nazareth. I mean, if it had been maybe the son of a king, oh, okay, or maybe an important priest, sure. Maybe if you know, he had been pointed to a military man with courage and charisma, okay, I, that's the guy, that's the Messiah. But a little baby in the arms of a poor young girl from Nazareth? This wasn't exactly the image that the Jews had of their Messiah. And Simeon was a Jew. And yet, this was the one God led him to as the fulfillment of his lifelong promise. You see, God's ways are not our ways, but His ways are perfect, even if they seem strange to us at times even if they seem uncomfortable to us at times. Even, believe it or not, if they don't make sense to us. Well, Lord, that doesn't make any sense. His ways are still perfect, even though they may not make sense to us at times. You see, sometimes God's answer is right before our eyes, but we don't recognize it because we don't want it in a package, because we want it in a package that we like rather than the way that He presents it. I've often said that sometimes what God gives you as His answer is like a pearl inside of a brown paper bag. We're always looking for His answer to be wrapped up in glitter and sparkle. And we won't even look at the brown paper bag that's there because inside there's the pearl. Waiting patiently for God's fulfilled promise requires us to accept God's answer, not our answer, when it comes. Lesson number two about waiting patiently. Waiting patiently is an acceptable form of service to God. You know, Simeon did absolutely nothing in his life and service to cause or to hasten the arrival of the Messiah. You know, if it were me, I'd be putting up posters up in the temple. You know what I'm saying? I, 
I'd have a website about, you know, have you seen the Messiah? And yet God considered him righteous and devout and worthy of a special revelation, a revelation he didn't give to any other person other than John the Baptist. Can you ever thought about that? The apostles asked Jesus to enable them to do the works of God. You know, they, they wanted to do miracles like Jesus, whom they had just seen feed the 5,000 and walk on the water. They wanted to do miracles like that. And you know, we're like that too sometimes. We want to do great things for God. And, and that's okay because sometimes that's what's needed, great things. But on this occasion, Jesus answered them by saying, this is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. They say to Him, hey, we want to do the great things that you're doing. And He says, okay, then believe in me. That's the great thing I want you to do, believe in me. You know, sometimes believing and waiting patiently are the only tasks required of us by God. That's hard for us to understand in this country and in this nation and in this Western hemisphere, this got to do it, got to get it done, you know, high achieving, task oriented, object motivated society we live in. That's tough. Whether it's waiting for the next step or the next mission or simply waiting for death to take us home, like Simeon. I mean, imagine, he says, hey, once the promise is fulfilled, you can go now. If it's the Lord that we're waiting for, then our faithful and patient waiting is fully pleasing and acceptable to God. One of the things that I say to individuals who have long-term illnesses, <clears throat> I don't mean having a cold or you, know, you broke your arm and it takes a month to get it fixed. I mean long-term, we're talking months and years of illness and debilitation and so on and so forth. Many times people who are advanced years, so on and so forth. And as devout Christians, many times they begin to feel guilty and they say, you know, I, I can't even make it to church anymore. I, you know, I, I can't even get out the door to get to church. And that's code. That's code for I feel useless. I mean, I used to be very active and I used to be able to serve the Lord and do all kinds of things and now I can't even go, I can't even do the basic thing which is go to worship. And I tell them, has God permitted you to be in this situation? And they say, well, yes He has. Find them. Sometimes Sometimes what he's given us is a ministry of suffering. And I don't say that lightly. Sometimes our ministry is a ministry of suffering. We wait patiently for healing or death. And that in itself is a ministry, is a serious matter. And yet acceptable to God if we wait in faith if we wait in faith. If it's the Lord that we are waiting for, then our faithful and patient, patient waiting, regardless of our circumstances, is fully pleasing and acceptable to Him as service. And then perhaps one other lesson, God always fulfills His promises, always, always. Simeon had the promise, but during his wait, there must have been times that he grew tired and restless. Some may have pitied poor old Simeon. Yeah, Simeon, you know that old guy wandering? He thinks he's going to see the Messiah in his lifetime. Note that Simeon had no following. He wasn't recognized by the high priest. All he had was the promise, that's all he had. 
and God answered it unexpectedly one day and made his joy and his life complete. <clears throat> Simeon's experience is a parable to teach us about our own experience with God's promise to each of us. And here it is, that one day he will come and in the twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed and we will all be with him in heaven rejoicing forever. That's the promise that all of us here tonight have received. That promise will be fulfilled one day. And you know what? Probably on a day and at a moment and in a way that we cannot imagine now. And probably in a way and in a manner and at a moment that will catch us off guard. That will catch us in mid-sentence. That will catch us just trying to do something or dreaming about something big or in the middle of a great idea or perhaps in the middle of the night as we suffer with whatever we suffer for yet one more night. So don't let the mocking or the indifference of the world deter you from waiting patiently on your Lord. He will come and you will be so happy that you waited. Just like Simeon was so happy that he waited. In closing, let me say one last thing about God's promise. <clears throat> it's for everybody. It's for everybody. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, God promises that if you believe and obey His Son, Jesus Christ, you too will receive the promised blessing of eternal life when he come. You see, Simeon, he was the only one that had the promise. He couldn't get together with other people and be encouraged. He had to hold it to himself. We, on the other hand, have the promise given to all of us. And we're able to gather here and encourage and support one another as fellow recipients of that promise. And so I invite you, if you want that promise for yourself, Give your life to Christ by repenting of your sins, by being buried in the waters of baptism in His name. And if you've been impatient, if you've given up on His promise and you want to return to Him to reclaim your blessings in Christ, then of course, come back, come forward, be restored. And restored to what? Restored to patiently waiting. Either way, the Lord also waits patiently for every sinner to come home to Him.